Hi everyone, it's Quickie Baby, and welcome back to World of Tanks, and specifically, welcome back to my Masterclass series. These videos go above and beyond what my normal videos do to give you recommendations for builds as to how to take your tanks to the next level. Now let me clarify, if you're a beginner, this probably isn't the video for you. I'd recommend going and checking out my full tank review of the UDES 1516. However, if you're the intermediate to advanced player, then maybe I can help you out with some builds that have worked, at least for me, to be the most impactful I've ever been in my UDES 1516. So before we discuss the overall ethos of the UDES, let's take a look to see how it's been performing, at least with regards to its win ratio compared to all of the other tier 10 medium tanks. And we see that only the CS63 has a better win ratio out of any of the tech tree medium tanks. So the UDES 1516 is kind of a bit of a sleeper OP tank. Accordingly, if you want to try and achieve your third mark of excellence in the UDES, at least in the last 30 days, it is the second hardest tier 10 tech tree medium tank to do so. And you're going to be having to hit 4,421 average if you want to get your third mark on this vehicle. So when it comes to a tank comparison, the only tank that's really like the UDES 1516 is the STB-1. And unfortunately, its Japanese competition has the better penetration, both on its standard and its gold rounds, the better DPM, the better shell velocity, which is definitely one of the UDES's main weak points. But at least the UDES does have a higher caliber, 120, which can allow you to overmatch the side of tanks like the STB-1, and it does have 440 alpha damage. Gun handling wise is back and forth between these two tanks. The UDES isn't great, but isn't terrible. It's right on the cusp of where I don't feel the vertical stabilizers get that much value on this vehicle. And because of the tank's limited top speed of 50, I actually end up preferring to use a turbo on this tank for the majority of the maps that I play. One of the strengths of the UDES 1516 has to be the gun depression. 13 degrees is absolutely outrageous. But let me clarify one important thing, and that is that the UDES's gun depression is actually incredibly awkward. It has six degrees on the, the turret and then seven degrees for the hydropneumatic suspension. And so what this means is that unless you want to slow the vehicle down to be able to then use the hydropneumatic suspension at the back, you've only got six degrees. And when we compare this to the STB-1, which actually has eight degrees of depression before it even has to use its hydropneumatic suspension, and then it gets an additional six, it kind of makes the UDES just feel very disappointing that it, it doesn't even have the most gun depression out of these two vehicles uh, after Wargaming buffed the STB-1. Mobility-wise, the UDES is okay. 50 isn't the best top speed limit, but it can reverse quickly and has an okay power to weight. And the tank's armor, you would forgive, forgive it for looking very underwhelming, but remember, this thing has quite the turret. And if you are using the vehicle six degrees of gun depression, good luck going th through this thing reliably with standard rounds. And it's only vehicles that are firing truly high penetration, high explosive anti-tank like Yag Panzer 100s, or maybe even an M60 50% of the time that you have to be concerned about. One of the things that I really hate about the UDES 1516, however, is its 390 meters view range. This means that unless you have a really good crew and a premium consumable, you're most likely going to want to have coated optics on this vehicle. But on the other hand, one of the things that a lot of people don't consider about the UDES 1516 is it actually has one of the best camera ratings on any medium tank in the game, second only to the Object 416 and the Borask, or so I should say third only to those two tanks. Accordingly, this means that the UDES is capable of ridiculous camo rating scaling with things like an exhaust or even just concealment on your crew. In turn, I like to have two builds on my UDES. One is an all-purpose combat build where I use a turbo, vents, and a gun rammer. However, if you are a free-to-play player and you can't use a premium consumable and you don't have a very good commander with recon and situational awareness, you're most likely going to want to drop that turbo out to use coated optics instead. And then the second set of equipment that I use on this vehicle is vents with a commander's vision system and with an exhaust. And that gives me 42% concealment when I'm moving on this vehicle and even 51% when I'm stationary. Now, you could pump this up a little bit more by alternatively using the exhaust insulation, which would give you another 2%, or you could even, even use yourself natural cover on this vehicle. But I personally prefer to use the focus on target designated target perk. 
which when combined with designated target is going to be lighting up your opponents for an obnoxious amount of time. And that's perfect when you're basically playing like a pure scout. Field mods wise, when I'm playing my Udez, I want to take the module durability increase so that my gun and my ammo rack continue to function. I'm going to be pumping up the accuracy of this vehicle because I don't have to worry about the dispersion too much. And then I'm going to be reducing the reverse speed of this vehicle and increasing the camera rate by an additional 3%. Personally, I think you should take the scouting for the second slot category to be able to allow your commander's vision system to work perfectly. And then this is a bit of a tricky one. For the, for the seventh slot, I've decided to take neither because I have just about enough view range, 451 for where I feel comfortable. If you are free to play player, you could actually end up taking the enhanced view range, possibly instead of taking coated optics on this build, or alternatively, you could take yourself the heavy gauge nozzles instead of a turbo and use coated optics on this vehicle, and then you'll still have enough view range to spot at a decent fashion while also still having a nice little top speed boost. And then finally, I personally like to take the lightweight support rollers so I can get my track back on more quickly rather than having it taken off in the first place. And that's because this vehicle still feels like it has quite a long repair time that even a large repair kit can't really get into a comfortable position. All right, so first thing I'm rolling out on Redshire, and this is definitely kind of a 50-50 map about which build I would prefer to take. Do you take the gun rammer and the turbo to be able to help out with your mobility and your combat performance, or do you take the exhaust and the commander's vision system to try and spot out? I personally went for the, uh, the damage build on this map, although I think when it actually happened live, I think I was kicking myself thinking that I would have needed the extra spotting capacity on this map. Because if you have the spotting capacity, you can just go forwards onto a ridge line, find a bush, and try and get the initial spotting. That is how I love to play this tank. I do not believe that this vehicle is meant to be played at the back. I believe it's meant to be played forward, where it can use its camera rating, hopefully to get into position unspotted, unlike we have managed, and then try and use its great gun depression to try and work a ridge line. I don't feel that this is a, a tank that's best suited to playing support at the back. I think it's a vehicle that even though it's got a fairly low top speed limit that you can help with the turbo that wants to get forward as much as possible and try to dominate those early positions. And all of you experienced players out there will know just the kinds of positions that you want to uh, on all of the different maps. So right now we've got a light tank making their way across and I'm hopefully going to be able to snap out. And you're going to see one of the most ugly things about this tank. And that is the penetration, but more importantly, the shell velocity. 1,000 meters a second on its standard rounds and 840 on its gold rounds. And do you see how its gold pen is only 310? Yeah, these are horrible, horrible rounds of ammunition. With the shell velocity on the HE rounds, only 680. And the alpha damage only increases to 530 from 440. I don't really feel like that's great gains compared to a lot of the other medium tanks in the game. So I didn't feel comfortable being by myself in that frontal position. I felt like there are two SCB-1s on the enemy team and the UDES, and then all it would take would be a brief moment for them to come into the dip to be able to take me out. And so I didn't feel safe at all. I also didn't feel that any of my friends went down the west of this map, and so what's the point of me being forwards? on that ridge line in the bush trying to spot out for vehicles who just frankly aren't going to be able to hit the targets that I light up. And so don't be afraid in a UDES if you feel that that initial position isn't working out to, to drop back or maybe try and assist another flank or try to, to make a push from another avenue because that's exactly what we're doing here. Okay, so clearly we've got to watch out for the Fosh. They're in a platoon with the FV215B183. And I expected the FV215B183 to be in the middle of the map. Now, because I took my combat setup and I didn't take a commander's vision system, I can't really be too sure about the vehicles that were in, in that kind of G5 area. If I had, then I probably would have been able to, to get a better idea of where the tank destroyers are, or maybe even light them up for my gun line behind. But alas, it wasn't to be. So one thing that I don't like to do is just sit on a flank and kind of wait for my opponents to push me, especially in a vehicle like this, which has great camo and great flexibility on a ridge line. We can afford to, to get forwards, and if I find the Fosh, I can hit them in their weak points. And while if they are loading high explosive anti-tank, yeah, they're going to do nasty things to my turret, as I showed you uh, when we were doing an armor review of this, uh, of this tank. I'm still not so dissuaded that I wouldn't want to go and take the fight to them. Okay, so 
let's now take a look through the middle of this alleyway and see if I'm going to be able to get some cross shots here. It's not the case. I'm going to hug the building here on my right to make sure that I, I'm still in cover if the Fosh 155 is in position. And I'm still not managing to find him. I really thought at this stage that I'd be able to find the Fosh, and there we go, there they are. So I've got two decisions. One is I go in on the left, or two is that I swing towards the right. And because he was falling back behind that tower, I felt like I could swing out towards the right, and while it was a bit of a risk that I could have got hit by one of the FVs at the back of the map, I feel like it stops the Fosh from being able to just come around the corner for free, and then hold down his mouse button and farm out my entire tank. Now that I feel that the Fosh is a little bit isolated compared to my friends, I'm going to come round and I'm going to lock his tracks down. And again, I'm a little bit worried about his FE215B183 friend right now. But um, what is worse for you to do? To, to not see that he's fired at the 430U and that he's going to be on reload and to take an opportunity to really go to town with the gun rammer and vents that you have on the vehicle or, or just, just being an idiot and not actually going around the corner, right? So the Progetto finishes off the Udez and I want to highlight just how awesome this alpha damage feels with this rate of fire. You don't have the rate of fire of the STB-1. But when you're hitting this hard, it just makes every single shot feel so much more significant and also allows the vehicle to trade very well. But here's one thing I really want to highlight, and that is just how useful it is to have a 120mm gun compared to 105. Remember what I said about the STB-1 side armor? He's only got 35, and so I'm just going to lock down this guy's tracks. And in this kind of a situation, I can reverse, be very comfortable. He bounces off my upper hull, I lock down his tracks again. And yeah, I can overmatch his entire side armor, so even if I only had a couple of degrees and he turns into me, there's nothing that he can do about it. And that just allows me to grind that SDB1 down and finish him off. And his uh, ill-fated advance into me to try and regain the position on the west here, where I'm still playing as a bit of a lone wolf, albeit with a progetto towards the center, is just working out really well for me. And this is where I just love the camera rating on the Udes. The fact that I can just be able to go in, and it's not like other medium tanks where I'm going to get spotted, just allows you to make the jump on your opponents. And when you hit this hard, having the jump on your opponents just feels real good. So there's the platoon mate of the Fosh 155. Doesn't look like he was able to get any clean shots into me, thankfully, because 1,950 hit points doesn't go a long way when they hit you for 1,750. So in this situation, I just want to be aggressive. Uh, the Fosh B, he's going to be able to hit me a couple of times, maybe, maybe three times here. I actually probably should have shot the tracks of the Fosh B there, but luckily he doesn't have much gun depression. I go forwards, backwards very quickly. My team lock him down and uses his repair kit and I lock him down again. And this is where this vehicle just feels very comfortable with the gun depression. There really aren't many angles on many ridge lines that you should be fighting on where you can't be able to just rock and roll in the Fosh. And we're up to 5,700 damage now. I'm going to use the Fosh B to avoid the shell from the FE 215B183. Now seeing that the FE has fired, of course I'm going to fire at the Fosh instead. And there you have it. 6,000 damage and 300 assistance in a game that really didn't look like it was going to go so well from the get-go. I feel that I really want to highlight once again how important it is to not be afraid to push in a vehicle like this. Just because it's a ridgeline tank doesn't mean that you shouldn't also try and depend on the camo. And I felt like it's when I had true confidence in the tank that I really started to go on good runs with it. All right, so now we're loading in on Muravanka and guess what equipment I'm going to be using? Yeah, I'm going to be using an exhaust with a commander's vision system and I'm going to be throwing vents into the mix as well. I feel like vents with a premium consumable and good crew skills on this tank mean that you don't have to take coated optics and you don't have to make the sacrifice to your top speed which you'd have to drop down to 48 to be able to gain that extra 3% view range. If, of course, you've got the luxury of having the field mods. I'm going to have about 450, maybe 454 meters view range in this game. And I want you to be the judge of what is going to be more efficient. Would it be, would it have been to, uh, to have coated optics and to have more like 490 meters view range? Or will it be having 450 on this tank and using the vision system? So when I'm playing again, I want to get forward and I want to dictate the initial engagement. I'm playing on Muravanka. One of the best tank types on Muravanka are light tanks. And so I don't want to allow this T100LT to uh, to compete against me. I if, if he's not using an exhaust, I have the same camo as him. But I've obviously got the armor. I've got the alpha damage. I've got the DPM. I've turned my Udez kind of into a light tank with this build that just kind of lacks the, the top speed, of course. I'm only able to go at 50. 
and I probably won't have quite as much view range as a T100 LT would, and I might not have quite as much camo, of course, if he's going to be hunting an exhaust when I'm moving. <laughs> I will do when I'm stationary, however. But I really feel that the UDES 1516 is sleeper OP with regards to its ability to be a moving presence of vision. It's like a light tank with regards to its camo that can still have the turret armor, can still hit hard, but it doesn't have the ammunition that the SDB-1 has. And that's really where, from like a combat perspective, this thing won't ever come close to an SDB-1. But it's kind of like a, a light tank plus plus within um, its damage dealing regards. And so that's how I ended up playing the vehicle, as, as a forward force which would use either its damaging setup build or alternatively its spotting setup to be able to gain an advantage. All right, so that unfortunately was tracking rather than spotting against the IS-7, but maybe I was lighting him up with my vision, uh, irrelevant of the tracking that went into the place. So let's, let's move on now. We're going to keep advancing over towards the south, and this is where the UDES just doesn't really feel very fast. I'm the same speed as a 430U, and I'm just barely kind of keeping up with the Chieftain in this regard. But now, this is where this replay is going to start to get very nutty indeed. Do you see how many tank destroyers are playing? It looks like about half of the enemy team are tank destroyers. And considering that they've lost one of their light tanks, a medium tank and a, and a heavy tank, I think you can probably see where this is going. So I spot the leopard, and I don't get spotted. Outrageous. That is what 42% camera rating on the move will allow you to do, while still having the vision system to be able to penetrate through bushes. Don't know what that leopard was doing or thinking. We've managed to get them out of the game immediately. We spot the 268. Not sure if it's through some shrubs or not. And we're able to spot the FE405 at a decent distance. Maybe because he's moving or maybe just because he's got terrible camera rating to boot. Looks like we actually lit up that T100 LT as they advance towards us. And yes, that's confirmed as we managed to get a bit more spotting. And again, we're not lit up even though we're firing in this scenario. We're going to take chances. Maybe the 268 spots me now. I was thinking probably going to spot me. Guess it was a little bit greedy to go for the damage on the T110 E3. But when I'm hitting for 440, I really want to get it going. So I really expected to get spotted there by the E3. It wasn't the case. Again, when you've got this 42% concealment when you're moving, when you fire, it's probably still going to go down towards the, the, the 5 or the 8 mark. And 5 or 8% uh, camera rating, even when you're firing, is nothing to, to sneeze at. It's not good, but it's, not, it's definitely something to take into account. Because a lot of these tank destroyers will have very limited view range. And when you're kind of like sitting at that 440 meters mark, you could probably be firing at them without them being able to, to see you. So we're just going to slide forwards here against the gorilla. We're not going to... We'll have to take a look in the post-game stats to see whether we actually got all of that spotting against the gorilla or not. There might have been actually some hidden spotting that the game hasn't uh, taken into account for yet. And you just see how we're relentlessly spotting these tanks without getting spotted ourselves. And while it is down to a little bit of the bushwork that I'm doing, something that anyone could be able to do in this tank. It is also down to the fact that this vehicle just has frankly broken camo with an exhaust when you have all of the field mods and you set this thing up in the way that I have. We're up to 9,700 assistance and 2,600 in a sub five minute game. What more can you really achieve with regards to combines in a medium tank? Well, the answer is not a lot. So, we've managed to finish off the T124. Artillery hits us. I don't care, mate. I'm hopefully going to slap you very hard. And I expect that the 430U is going to be able to shoot him before I manage to, to pick up the second shell. And I'm already making my way towards the Leopard, because why wouldn't we? We're playing in the second hardest tech tree medium tank to mark in the game. At least with regards to Tier 10. We've got to try and get as much as we possibly can, right? If we want to stand hope, or, or have a hope in hell of being able to achieve it. And that was... 13,400 combined that we saw. And actually, if we take a look at the post-game stats, that was over 15,000 combined in a five and a half minute game. And the outrageous thing about this tank is you can set it up like a scout with, with the second build that I'm recommending on this vehicle, but you can still hit really hard with that high 440 alpha damage. Imagine it kind of like a manticore within that regard, but just with 50 extra alpha. So I want to give you another example of this and give you an in-depth spotting scouting guide here on Prokhorovka. I'm going to be using an exhaust with a vision system and vents. Again, 
I'm going to have about 450, maybe 455 meters view range, just how I did on Muravanka on the, the previous battle. And I want you all to be the judge about whether 450 meters view range is enough in World of Tanks for the majority of situations that you get yourself into. And here's one of the things that I've been thinking a lot in World of Tanks recently, is that you, of course, you can go from about 450 or 460 up to 480. But why wouldn't you instead drop the coated optics and focus on something like an exhaust? And then you can take vehicles like this and basically take them from being medium tanks and turn them into light tanks. All right, so in this situation, I'm playing with a 13105 on my team. And the 13105 isn't the best of light tanks when it comes down to proficient scouting. And we're playing against the mother of all scouts, aka the Manticore on the enemy team. That vehicle has incredible camo. If he's got it set up right, it's probably going to end up with something like 50% camo on the move for a proper Ravka battle. We're also still having more than enough view range to be able to uh, to spot us. Now, I don't really want to be sitting behind this 13105 here for very much longer because... Obviously, if I do, it's kind of a, a it's a terrible move because we'll have both of our eggs in the same basket. And I, we're not getting any of the vision out that now I am as I've managed to come forwards in the VZ-55. And I'm going to use this distraction from the Object 268 version 4 to come forwards. Now, from this position, it's just absolutely beautiful because you get vision down the center. And that Manticore made a misplay, I guess, worried about the 268 version 4 getting some cross vision. And even though we lit them up, the Manticore doesn't get caught. This position is outrageously good because you get vision across on the E100 over here. You can also spot anyone who tries to poke that ridge. You get all of the vision down this area where it's a really long avenue from where the road kind of snakes over. And you sometimes can even manage to get spots on tanks like the Batchat who managed to go up. Now that Manticore, he has just gone forwards once again into my vision. 377 spotting. I'm just praying. Come on, finish him, finish him, finish him. You can only be so happy in World of Tanks. But I actually managed to get spotted there with his final reporting run. I didn't think I was going to get lit up in that situation, but I did. Still, even if I was to, to fall in the battle right now, this would be a great result. I will trade myself for a Manticore on this map any day, knowing that hopefully our 13105 is going to go on. But remember, with the way that I've set this vehicle up, it's very unlikely that the 13105 is going to be as a proficient scout as me. And so I'm effectively taking that class away from the 13105 here. I guess if they were to set themselves up with an exhaust and a vision system and vents, they could probably have a little bit better camera rating on the move. But the, the, the vision that this vehicle gets, uh, or shall I say, uh, yeah, the vision that this vehicle gets with its 390 meters view range is the same as what the 13105 is going to be able to achieve. So in this situation, it's just about hanging tough, being calm, the E100 is going to get grinded out, and we can even spot so far back as that. I guess that was the E100 firing, having his camera rating broken, and the vision system that we're using manages to just break the final bit of camera that he will have from the, the bushes that be between me and the E100. So right now, I'm just going to remain chill. The priority is to get the VZ-55 out. If the VZ-55 gets taken out, then that means that we are going to be able to start to advance again. I'm asking this E4 to retreat because I really don't want him sitting in that line. One of the worst things that can happen is if that E4 gets spotted right now and they've got a bunch of TDs in this position, they will fire across. One thing I'd like to recommend is that you use the left uh, path here of the bushes, if you can, to be able to, uh, to avoid that. Because if these tanks get spotted, most of the enemy's fire is going to be coming from here and here. And obviously that fire will go past you and you're not going to get blind fired in this situation. Also, when you're in this position, it will allow you to be able to drop out into the dip if you do get spotted. And sometimes you're going to survive just like we had with the Manticore. Okay, so I think I'm going to get a little bit uh, antsy in this situation. Looks like the enemies are going to start to try and blind fire us. I'm going to spot the E100 a little bit. I'm just going to speed up the replay for a second because this part of the battle is a little bit more of a resident sleeper. And I'm highlighting the the, the, the positions there that we could have like a, an extra line of vision. But of course, because we've got a 13105 and a UDES, that wasn't really ever going to be the case. So eventually, I'm going to get a little bit bored and I'm going to... Uh, tell the 13105 that th we must wait for the VZ to die to self-propelled guns. And so this kind of a situation, it's about just 
hoping that your artillery are going to be able to hit, and also hoping that your artillery are going to actually focus on the tanks that kind of matter. Looks like my 13105 gets a good bit of a spot there against the Fosh, although the Fosh is so hidden that it's probably going to be tricky for our team to be able to handle them. And at this stage of the game, it's just about patience and hoping again that the artillery are going to focus on the VZ-55. And you'll notice that every time that VZ-55 gets spotted, I'm using my request fire at him. And again, I tell the artillery on my team, SPG, we need VZ-55 out first. And to be fair, they start to try and nail them. Now, this 13105 on my team has actually managed to get forwards quite far. And that kind of gives me a little bit more faith that they probably don't have any vehicles up towards the high ground. Now the mouse is wanting to push through that again makes me a little bit nervous because if he gets spotted the 13105 is going to get taken out. And you know what, if that Fosh 155 now falls up towards the west of the map that's going to allow me to push. Especially with the CS63 getting shut down so good vision there from our 13105. So I decide that I want to try and help them out as well. So I'm going to get forwards and I'm going to use the camera rating that this vehicle has to continue the pushing play that the 13105 is. And now, oh, juicy, juicy, juicy spotting here on that poor E100. The 13105 is going to come and join me as well. But unfortunately, until that E100 dies, we're not going to be able to get any further forwards. And I think we just got the entire spotting on that E100. And we were at 5,000 spotting. But look how this is going to ramp up and up. Artillery gets taken down. E3 here, we're just so easily able to spot them with this third best camera rating medium in the game. If you like to play your Borask and you know the kinds of things that you can do in a Borask with your vision, you can do all of those things at tier 10. And I can tell you, for maps like Muravanka and maps like Prokhorovka, and even if you get onto Malinovka as well, it just completely changes the game into your team's favor. We had two light tanks on this map and the enemy, I guess they only had one. Now, I guess the Batchat could have tried to set up in, in the same kind of way as me, but the Batchat just doesn't have the camera that the Udez has on the move. And so I've never found a medium tank, especially at tier 10, that I feel so confident to try and play it like a light tank and to have results which are frankly light tank worthy. With 11,000 spotting nearly here and 875 assistance. That is how you win your games on Prokhorovka. Double the amount of light tanks that your team has. And the result was that this was my third mark of excellence for the Udez. And I did it without even really having to fire more than a couple of shells against my opponents. And this run of games all happened just last weekend where we played 12 battles after my tech tree showcase and we managed to average 6,500 combined with the setups that you've seen today. And so to conclude, the Udez 1516 is a very underrated tier 10 medium tank and I don't see enough people in the community really celebrating the fact that it has the second best average win ratio of any tier 10 medium tank. You don't see all that many of these things on the battlefield which is crazy considering how sleeper OP their camo rating is. However, let me also clarify that this isn't a vehicle that really excels in the hands of a player who doesn't also know the intricate, detailed combat of light tanks. For you to really get the most out of this tank, you're going to have to know both playstyles, hold down medium and also sneaky scout work. And while that can be a very addictive kind of playstyle of gameplay once you've managed to master it, I think for the vast majority of people out there, they're probably going to end up having more fun in the STB1. There is a massive difference in having six degrees of gun depression without the hydropneumatic suspension like the UDES has and having eight degrees like the SDB-1 has. It makes the vehicle feel oh so much more comfortable. Also, this vehicle's a little bit of a freak and a weirdo, which means that the vast majority of players out there are probably going to have an easier time playing the STB-1, which is pretty much just like put your front towards your opponents and absolutely blast them with higher DPM, 
better penetration, better shell velocity, and massively better gold ammunition than the Udez has, where this tank's really going to end up struggling when you end up trying to bludgeon your way through vehicles like a Mouse or an IS-7, for example. And so the Udez 1516 definitely gets a big thumbs up from me as being an underrated and little celebrated tier 10 medium tank. But I think, again, only in the hands of the above average or exceptional players uh, who are going to know how to use this tank's strengths will it actually be above average. Anyway, ladies and gents, boys and girls, that's it for today. Really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did and you felt like it was useful, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, however, give it a thumbs down. And let me know in the comments what you think about the Udez 1516. Are you surprised that it has the second best win ratio of a tier 10 medium tank? And how do you like to set yours up? Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, thank you so much for watching. You've been epic and hopefully I'll see you soon.